something that happens between the parent and the child, well, obviously the, the parent in this case and the provider. Um, there were a couple of physicians on our call that had concerns about that, you know, not seeing their role um, as, as having to, quote, flip parents. You know, if someone comes in with strong um, beliefs, that as long as they've had a conversation and they've explained the risks and benefits and that parent, for whatever reason, chooses not to, um, that's why we sort of came down on the side of 606 saying that we should take that away. 471 seemed to be the more reasonable option. Um, are there people who are missed um, who, who can have a philosophical objection and never speak to a physician about Yes. Okay. Where does that happen? <laughs> Well, that's a good question, uh, Representative. I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about that. Uh, you know, there are people, I'm hearing echoes of yes in the background behind me, but, um, you know, some children don't have a medical home. Uh, they aren't fortunate enough to have a pediatrician or a primary care provider that they see regularly. They may not get all their well-child visits. Um, so that does concern us that they could be, could be missed in this process. So could that be as simple as a check in the school, a school form that comes home with them? I'm just not aware of what the process is for somebody to exercise their philosophical objection. That, uh, what's the easy? What's the easiest slide for that? I'm curious. Yeah, that's a great question, and certainly something to wrestle with for the work session. Okay. I don't have any um, thoughts about sort of yeah. what the, simple, the most simple uh, possibility would be, but I believe that 471 is a good option. Yeah. It at least requires that a conversation would happen. Okay. And maybe for the work session. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Any breath? Welcome. Hey. That better be for me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, first I'll start with um, many uh, may know that there is a tradition um, in the legislature that those who come back um, to the legislature, usually to the committee that they served on, to bring treats to those individuals who, who serve on the committee. Um, I did bring dark chocolate, very healthy for you all. Um, and also that I didn't serve on this committee, but I was um, here very, very often. Um, it's been so, enough time here that you're allowed to do this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to bring you things. Thank you. Well, first, um, mate, I want to thank you all for um, this very um, thoughtful hearing. Um, I know how hard you work, and um, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Brakey, Chairman Gatine, Armal members of Health and Human Services, I am Ann Graham, and I live in North Yarmouth. I'm here today to testify in strong support of LD 471, an act to improve childhood immunization rates in Maine. I have been a nurse for close to 35 years and a pediatric nurse practitioner for almost 30. I have seen the positive effects of vaccines as they prevent illness that could cause permanent damage and even death. I have seen when that protection is absent. My first job as a PNP was at a practice at Children's Hospital in Boston in 1986. A little girl around age two came in with a high fever and irritability. We'll call her Amy. Amy rapidly became more ill. The physicians were stumped, but after a workup that took quite a while, they determined that Amy had H. flu meningitis. Meningitis, as many of you know, is an infection and inflammation of the brain and the spinal cord. The good news is that Amy lived. The bad news was that she was deaf and would remain so for the rest of her life. I am guessing that Amy is close to 30 years old now, and I suspect that she's a mom and has children of her own. And I would want, I really wonder what she would say about this bill and about vaccines in general. So why do I tell this story? Because this type of meningitis rarely occurs today because of a safe and effective vaccine. Once common just 30 years ago, good science and good care have virtually stopped a disease that caused death and disability. Those who fall victim to the illness are those who are unvaccinated, those who are immune suppressed because of the effects of chemotherapy, um, for cancer or other immune disorders, and infants who are too young to receive vaccines. My entire adult professional life has been dedicated to the health and well-being of children and their families. I've done that at the bedside, the office, school-based clinics, 
and in the halls of the State House. All the care I have provided to children has been based on scientific data, but not, not fear and not anxiety. I um, don't have this in my testimony, but I will send it to you. Um, um, quoting from a uh, update from the World Health Organization, February 2015. Key facts, key facts. Measles is one of the leading causes of death among young children, even though a safe and cost-effective vaccine is available. In 2013, 145,700 measles deaths globally, about 400 deaths every day, or 16 deaths every hour. Measles vaccine resulted in a 75% drop in measles deaths between 2000 and 2013. During 2000-2013, measles vaccination prevented an estimated 15.6 million deaths, making measles vaccine one of the best buys of public health. Being a parent is one of the toughest jobs in the world. As a mom, I want to love and protect my children as best as I can. I remember those first shots that my oldest son, Drew, received. He was a skinny little boy. He uh, was only born with one functional kidney. And he wasn't growing very well. I closed my eyes and held him still as he got his first few shots and I watched him the night that night and prayed that he would be healthier because of those shots. And I did the same for my next two boys. I understand the fear and anxiety, but I know that immunizations are the greatest success in public health in the 20th and 21st century. Drew's now 20 years, 25 years old, strong and healthy. I want to point out very clearly that 471 does not take choice away. I want to repeat that. It does not take choice away. What it does is provide informed choice. Not a single parent in this room or in this state will ever be forced to vaccinate their children. Not one. This is to provide information. Everyone has a right and a choice to refuse vaccination. Thank you very much for your time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Questions from the committee? Representative Vashon. Representative. Thank you for your testimony. As a doctor, I'm a nurse practitioner. A nurse practitioner. Engaging in the conversations of a new mother that is concerned about immunizing their child, just like what 471 is asking, mm -hmm. is that parents dialogue with a doctor, a nurse practitioner, whoever is delivering the vaccine. From your experience, when you're having that conversation with, with the parents, it's anxiety. It starts out with anxiety. Um, have you dealt with parents that have come in and said, I am not going to vac vaccinate my child, and then have a conversation and have them turn around and say, okay, you know what, I, I guess I am comfortable with this, or I'd like to, um, you know, postpone this and just put them on, on a schedule. I was just wondering what the frequency of those types of conversations are that you may have with, with a new mother. Um, thank you, Representative Vachon. I um, actually haven't had many conversations as you described, but I would tell you very honestly that if a parent came in and had the concerns that many of the concerns that we've heard today um, of individuals who were concerned about vaccinating their children, I will not try to turn them around. I will just try to provide information. I think that uh, it's very important to respect everyone's right um, I think that it's very important to have as many um, people be immunized for the public health um, needs of this country and world, to be honest. Um, but I will, my goal would never be to talk someone into something that they didn't want to do, but to provide information. My concern is many people are looking um, for information from Dr. Google, or they heard that their neighbor didn't do it, and that sounded like a great idea. And they didn't have the information, they didn't have the facts and data, um, and they were making decisions based on something else. Okay, so if I could just follow up, do you see 471 as an invitation for informed dialogue with, with a doctor or a nurse practitioner? That's mm -hmm. it. It's, it's just an invitation to get informed and then you make your own decision. Absolutely. Thank you for that um, characterization. I absolutely agree that that is what it is. Well, and and it, uh, it will just enhance care for our children. Thank you. 
I have, I have a question. Um, well, first of all, good to see you here. And um, I know, um, and you're probably someone who's been working on this issue as much as probably anyone in the room. So, as someone who's kind of here trying to sit through the and figure it out, um, I guess I wonder, as someone who's been working on this issue for a long time and, and hearing some of the testimony about some of the things as they exist on the federal level, I guess I wonder, do you have any concerns about the way the accountability structures are set up in terms of the lack of liability for, for pharmaceutical companies making these? Um, uh, these drugs, uh, what we're hearing, at least people are testifying to alleged scandals going on at the CDC. Do you have any concerns about that, or is it, um, or is it that the value of these over, overrides any concerns? Or I, I, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yes, Senator. I, I um, I have to say that um, I make my decisions based on World Health um, data on. Um, uh, the NIH, Institution, um, National Institute of Health. Um, I look for my data in clear scientific journals. Um, to be honest, the that's where how I make my decisions. Whether yes, I think those are important issues and they need to be addressed. But in the meantime, I think we need to keep our kids safe and healthy, and we need to maintain a strong public health structure. And uh, but I do think that those issues need to be addressed, but that's not the, the goal of this legislation. This legislation is to make sure people make real informed choices about whether they immunize their children. And, and I must again reiterate, no one will be made to, be, to vaccinate their children. No one will lose the choice in, in, four, in LD-471. Any additional questions? Thank you. No additional questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. And good job today. Next, we'll hear from Pam Cahill or Cahill. Shilla? All right. Um, Gabe Saviello. Welcome. Hi. Distinguished. Uh, Committee members, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, uh, my name is uh, Gabriel Sigiello. I'm a uh, practicing primary care pediatrician in the farm community. I live in Bolton, Maine, and I am here in support of LD 471. Um, many others have pointed out um, that a you know, abundance of uh, evidence supporting safety and efficacy of childhood immunizations. Um, I'm really here just to speak as another voice from practicing pediatrician in Maine um, to support the the concept of you know having the conversation with, um, with patients important part of, part of my job is is having that on honest comfort well, which I very much enjoy actually um, is going through the evidence talking with patients sitting down having a conversation about uh, what we do and what we don't know and everything uh, around um, the benefits the safety possible side effects and public health implications of the innovations that we get today. Um, uh, you know, it's been mentioned, and, and I would reiterate that health information is abundant and easily accessible, but as you can see from all the abundance of information that you probably received today, sometimes it's difficult to sort through what is reliable and what is um, the highest level of evidence. And ultimately, I believe that's what our job is as health professionals and educators, is to help us through that for our patients. Um, I'm also a father of four, two of which are in public schools. Um, you know, in the last year I've witnessed the Tussis sweep to our communities. Western Maine has been a particular conflict this, this past year. I've been in kind of other patients with the Tussis. Um, the measles outbreak has been referenced many times, uh, answering questions regarding that from, you know, scared parents. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I would, I would, uh, you know, I would like to have, to think that I'm sending my children to a nurturing and safe environment. And part of that is, what is afforded that is you know, high levels of immunization in our school systems. So um, you know, I will keep my testimony very short today. And so I would just uh, ask that you consider supporting for the All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, because this is a, a, a piece of paper that you have to sign off on, I'm going to ask you about this too, just in the practice management of seeing somebody and then having to sign off 
on the conversation um, and for potentially a pa person who wasn't the patient except to come in to get the document. Right. How, how would that work for you? Well, to be honest, in our practice, we already do a vaccine, vaccine declination form. Actually, we do it for all patients who don't um, have vaccines, which simply says that we had a conversation about the benefits and risks of vaccinations, um, and that um, you know the, the parent has understood that we've had a conversation, um, and uh, and then so we this is this would not be like an extra uh, at least for us it would not be an extra piece of you know something that we're basically already doing yeah. from a from a standpoint. Of, if this were to be someone who you had never seen before, just came yeah. in in order to get that done. Yeah, if it was someone who just came in to, to get it done, uh, you need to, to have a conversation, for instance, if there was someone who had gone through and not had a established member of primary care provider in the past. Um, my conversation would be similar, I assume. I mean, I would, I would have to, as I would for any consult, a patient I would be consulting on, I would want prior medical history um, and, and to know about the patient's personal, personal and family history before I could fully inform them. So I would do that on any you know, consulting, you know. Okay. So it would be a full visit for you. This would yeah, be we, part of that visit. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, these conversations take time. I mean, think of the amount of time we spent today on, on, on this. And, you know, these are, um, I think they're incredibly valuable conversations. So um, sometimes the rest of my day gets very behind having full conversations, with which I don't mind mm -hmm. because I think it's worthwhile. Thank you. Yeah. Seeing no additional questions, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, not using the whole time. You <laughs> <laughs> set a very good example for everyone to follow up. Uh, next, we'll hear from Deb Theatric of Freeport. Um, I'm going to cede my time to um, Anita Ruff, who actually was on the list oh. with her daughter, but... All right. Uh, Anita Ruff, come on next. <laughs> I feel like a lucky winner. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Senator Brakey, Representative Gatine, and members of the Standing Committee for Health and Human Services. You'd think I'd have all the morning to practice that. I'm here today to seek support in for LD-471 in opposition of LD-1076. I'm speaking, oh, I also live in Bath, and that's my daughter who spoke earlier. I'm really proud of her. <laughs> um, I'm speaking today as a mother and as a health educator. As a mother, it is critically important to me that my children live the healthiest lives possible so they can be ready to learn and to grow. They wear their seat belts, they brush their teeth, they eat lots of fruits and vegetables, and they are very physically active. They are also immunized against measles, whooping cough, and other vaccine-preventable diseases. This is part of my commitment to giving them the best start in life, one, is, one that is free from the horror of these diseases. There are many other mothers here today who are equally as concerned as I am about my children's health. And mother to mother, I understand that drive to do what's best for your child. However, I'm not doing what's best for my kids just because I believe it's the best thing. I immunized my children because for decades there has been irrefutable scientific research and public health initiatives that prove that vaccinations are the most effective thing to do to prevent diseases in children. As a health educator, I've spent my career helping people understand the complex issues of health. My first job after college was working at a local rural health department in Virginia. I was hired as the immunizations educator. My job was to promote the importance of immunizations to families and encourage them to vaccinate their kids to keep them disease free. Through this work, I saw some of the diseases that are making a comeback here in Maine. Almost 20 years later, I can still hear and see the little boy with whooping cough. There is nothing more difficult to watch than a little kid struggling for breath and violently coughing, and the powerless feeling that there is nothing you can do to help. I don't want that to happen to anyone's kids. It's horrible. As a health educator, it is my duty to provide evidence-based, credible health information 
Most people that I have helped are grateful to have someone wade through all the incorrect information or misleading health information for them. It can be overwhelming to figure out what to do for yourself or a family member, and I am lucky to be in a position to help. Professionally, I am unable to support the individual right to choose not to have your kids immunized because of personal beliefs, because it, is, it goes against what is known to be scientifically true. Immunizations work. I ask you to support LD-471, and I ask you to oppose LD-1076, a bill that is discouraged to decrease immunizations. I ask you to please support policies that protect our children and our communities against potentially deadly diseases. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Seeing no questions, appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Gerald Silbert, 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 Silbert. All right. Same as, same as ten days ago. Oh, <laughs> well, it's good to have you here again. Oh, are you now? Are you um, for or against? I'm pro on one, negative on the other. Oh, okay. So I'm flying two colors. All right. <laughs> Great. But I, okay. <laughs> but it seems only appropriate to take them in sequence. Uh, members of the committee, good to see you again. Uh, the last time I was here, I talked a little bit about the selective blind spot that the department has relative to treating kids with developmental disabilities. 471 is an, at least a starting attempt at opening up at least some kind of dialogue between the vaccine injury and the proponents of vaccination. So we have essentially warring concepts. What is good vaccination? What is bad vaccination? From my standpoint, clearly, uh, the, I didn't abrogate any of my rights as a parent when my son was born. He was born with a hole in his heart. Yet before his second APGAR, he got a hepatitis B shot. You know, I would simply hesitate to make the guess that I don't think he was going to share a needle or have unprotected sex anytime in the near future on the first day of life. I think that was unwarranted. It was only CDC policy for less than a month when I took place in December of 91. So we have that kind of a situation, we need to open up a dialogue. And we haven't done it. And the department hasn't done it. If we do open up the dialogue, and there is information flowing in both directions, then this whole quote-unquote vax, anti-vax thing disappears reasonably quickly. I personally find it, I'm not comfortable with parent versus parent. I never have to. And it's a problem. But if it's being set up as part of a business plan, I, I find it especially onerous. If the doctors will stay with the doctor, that's fine. And we can have that dialogue. But if they're simply implementing vaccination policy without explanation to parents, that's not good. So when we get to the philosophical questions, I want to maintain that. I want to have the right to say no. And I want my kid to have the right to say no. He's 23. Sooner or later, I leave this life. I don't know who the successor guardian would be. But since he's in state care, I want to stipulated that he's already vaccinated injured, let's not exacerbate the situation with giving him a re-challenge. So those are the two basic issues. I'd also like to, in the last minute, I'll tell you, I won't even take all of it. I'm three for three for vaccine injuries. My father was the president of the American College of Allergists and Immunologists. I am, by training, and by being a family member, 
I believe in vaccination and immunology, but there are limits to it, and I think we're overdoing it. Second thing is, you've heard that there are 271 vaccines coming down the pipe. I'm vaccine injured. I was one of the people, in 1967, my father gave me the measles shot. Eight years later, when I was a teacher at Amherst High School, I came down with atypical measles. One other person in the entire school, a kid. I spent a week molting. I lost the first two layers of my skin. My son had his vaccine injury based on multiple shots. I can't pin down which one hurt him, but I know one of them did. And then my wife. And she got a flu shot. And lo and behold, what happened with that? She came down with hemolytic anemia, damn near killed her. The question isn't going to be easily resolved. But if the department doesn't start listening to the fact that we need to have this dialogue, let alone the committee, the committee I think has been terrific, the department's got to listen. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Seeing no questions, appreciate it very much. Um, next, we're jumping back to those in opposition, and, and I apologize, I didn't actually announce many people ahead of time, so if, if they're here, uh, they're listening and elsewhere, that's a good opportunity. But um, we have uh, Suzanne Woodward, Brianna Woodward, Sam Woodward, no relation, I'm sure, uh, Ingrid Lavasser. Sabrina Newcomb, Debbie Summers, Gabriel, I'm sorry, so um, Holly Austin, Brooke Top Thompson, Tim Agnes, Emily Brown. Any of those folks here right now? Or anything? Uh, all right, is, is, are any of the Woodwards here right now? All right, so then we'll, uh, In Ingrid Lavasser is here, so she'll, she'll go first. If the Woodwards are here, we'll have a chance to speak. Senator Brakey, oh. Senator Brakey, Representative Gatine, and members of the Health and Human Services Committee, thank you for your attention to these important issues. My name is Ingrid Lavasser. I'm the mother of two daughters, ages 23 and 18 of Wyndham. I am here to speak in opposition to LD 606 and LD 471. 23 years ago, I made the difficult decision not to vaccinate my baby girl. That decision was not made lightly nor in haste. I found it and still find it to be the most, single most difficult decision as a parent. There were risks both ways. I read magazine articles, brochures, and pamphlets, and the dreaded fine print. As my children grew, I continued to educate myself about vaccines. At each well baby visit, I was asked about vaccination, and each time I replied, maybe next time. At no point did I fully close my mind to vaccination. I just found the information supporting vaccines to be irrational, erroneous, and not compelling. The thought of injecting my girls' undeveloped immune systems with multiple strains of diseases all at once was appalling. Even more disturbing than that were the neurotoxins like mercury or aluminum contained within the vaccines that are still in the vaccines today. Keep in mind, the slightest drop of mercury accidentally released in a school causes immediate evacuation of the students and the summoning of a hazmat squad. Why on earth would I agree to inject my kids with it? During my childhood, I contracted chickenpox, measles, and mumps. These were considered great opportunities to miss a week of school. Chickenpox was uncomfortable, but manageable. Measles, easier to tolerate. And mumps meant unlimited ice cream. There was no hysteria, panic, or outrage. There were no news reports of an outbreak of measles at the Lavasser household. How is it we've come to this place in my lifetime where panic fuels legislation? How is it my children would not be allowed in school without being immunized as promoted by LD 606? 
The way the law stands now regarding philosophical exemption is this. In the event of an outbreak, I agreed to remove my unvaccinated child from school and my child would not return until the threat had passed. Nothing more is necessary. We do not need the legislative overreach proposed by LD606. Please bear in mind that vaccinated children can contract the illnesses they're vaccinated against and subsequently spread the disease, even in school. LD471 suggests that I and other parents are incapable of assessing the risk to our children without medical counsel. We are somehow incapable of finding the reams of information that are available on both sides of the issue and making our own decision. Parents will not be given both sides of the issue at the pediatrician's office. If you understand that where the pediatricians are getting their information is from the CDC, which has been shown to be uh, under investigation. So this type of one-sided counseling, I do not see that as counseling, I see it as coercion. The right thing to do would be to strike down the LD-606 and 471 now. Preserve our freedom and our, our right to make health decisions for our family based on facts, not hysteria. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Lavasser. Uh, Representative Hyman. Thanks, thanks for being here. So I'm thinking about, you know, people who, who have a philosophical objection who would then be asked to see a physician to have a conversation with that person. And it sounds like you would be the person who wouldn't want to do that, um, to go to a, to a physician to have that conversation. So I wonder if we could talk about that a little bit. Um, I'm wondering what the obstacle would be for you. Um, if you had a pediatrician who you trusted and you, you um, would you find that um, a good thing to go and have that conversation? Well, in my own personal case, I already had those conversations with the doctor who, okay. I mean, I mentioned it went to well baby visits, yeah. I didn't skip them. Yeah. And each time we were asked, and I did have those conversations. So it wasn't just so much in my particular case, it's that in general, um, it's a question of where are the doctors getting their information from. If they are getting it from the CDC, which I suspect they are, there is some reason to be very suspicious of the information that's coming out of the CDC. We understand that they're under investigation. So that's where that comes from, really, is I think a lot of the doctors that are here today, um, their testimony was lovely, and they seem like wonderful doctors, any of whom I might have liked to take my kid to. But I think there are definitely doctors out there who have a, very much a bias, and I think it could be hard for other parents. I didn't find it hard to talk to my doctor in particular. It's just by now inserting this as yet another requirement for that ability to take a philosophical exemption, that's what I have the trouble with. But if you're already taking your, do your child to a doctor, that is going to come up anyway, because they're going to be offering you vaccinations, we always were offered those. Do you think there are some people who take philosophical exemptions who don't really think it through, they just, it's kind of the easy way out, they've sort of heard some things, they have a friend who didn't, and, and they skip through it? I can't imagine anybody doing that, quite frankly. I, it's too important an issue. I mean, nobody wants their kids to have communicable diseases, no, you know, there's certainly horror stories on both sides of people who are vaccine injured versus people who are injured by a disease. So you have both sides where the consequences are severe. And I saw it truly, and the way I felt about it the whole time was, I'm damned if I do, and I'm damned if I don't. If I don't vaccinate and something happened to my child, I could never forgive myself. And if I did vaccinate and something happened to my child, I could never forgive myself. So I, you know. Yeah. So I think that's where it really does have to be left as a parental decision and not something that is potentially forced. Yeah, that's that tension of wanting to do good and wanting to do no harm. Right. Right, yeah. right. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Basham. My friend. It's good to see you. Good to see you working. <laughs> I have a question for you. Mums, measles, chicken pods. Ice cream, a week off, a few mm -hmm. scabs. 
Mm-hmm. Your thoughts on meningitis, polio, mm-hmm. hepatitis. Mm-hmm. We had a couple of women here today mm-hmm. that have polio. Mm-hmm. Um, one that has worked worldwide to eradicate that, that disease and knows the consequences mm-hmm. of what time has shown for us is that we've been complacent over mm-hmm. the need to vaccinate. Um, so there was also earlier testimony, and I don't know if you were here from it, of, of a doctor um, who had uh, twins in, in, in Kimba, and they developed um, hepatitis A. 30 kids down in Kimba developed hepatitis A, and immediately the parents were all asking for vaccination. Only 10% of the, the parents chose not to vaccinate. So in light of some of those, what you've been grappling with of living with yourself with Mm -hmm. or without, um, I wanted your thoughts on the concept of 471 gives you that opportunity to dialogue and grapple with this and make a comfortable decision. That's what the bill Mm -hmm. is all about. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just wondering if you could go back, revisit that, and maybe come back from the work session and let me know if you see it a different way. Thanks. <laughs> Any additional questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll hear from Sabrina Newcomb. to, you know, okay. Well, thank you. Um, Good afternoon, Senator Brady.